those are interesting, but, but a lot of stuff goes on, you know, behind the scenes at subcommittee meetings and just in conversation. So it was a huge, huge learning curve coming on. I can on only imagine. I didn't know anything about municipal finance and how the school district operate. You know, I, I really didn't know a lot about that. So it was a huge learning curve coming on. Um, but it would, I just felt it was so important to be involved in the schools, yes. especially, you know, the kids were young then. My little one, I think, was two when I started, wow. and Meg was about six. But I just knew, you know, we're, we're going to be involved in the school district for a long time to come. We have no plans to ever leave Holden. <laughs> so it's something that I felt it was a good use of my time getting involved. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it's been good to, to really have a good, you know, almost inside work working knowledge of what goes on in the school district and the finances and and everything that goes into it. You know, a lot of people look at, you know, the district budget and think, oh, you know, $90 million budget. Oh, surely that's got to have all kinds of fat in it. And there, I mean, I have to say, honestly, there is not, you know, and, and that was one of the things that surprised me the most is, you know, we, the way Wachusett is set up and, and the way the state funding works is Wachusett has one of the lowest per pupil expenditures for kids compared to really? the entire state. Yes. Yeah, so we, we do great things with very little Holy money moly, compared yes. to others. Yes. You know, I, I talk to families from all different other towns across the state and, you know, I mean, some of them get so much more and, you know, from state funding and different things mm-hmm. that we just don't get, you know, but we do a good job with what we have. And, you know, special ed is, is always one of those hot button topics yes, and everyone, know. you know, oh, there, you know, there's so much money spent for special ed. Well, you know, first of all, it's a, it's a legal requirement, you know, the, the kids right. have to be serviced. And, you know, I've always said that, yes, there is a lot of money spent on special ed, but honestly, in our district, there's not a lot of money spent on anything. And I've always said, you don't need more money to spend on special ed. You just need to spend it wisely. You know, you need to put the resources in in the early years because that's going to have the most bang for your buck. You know, you, you can't have a great high school program, but not do a lot up until then because it doesn't matter by the time they get up there. Yes, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah, so, you know, the district is putting money into, you know, a new reading program, which is going to be good for those early years because you have to <sighs> teach them how to read because then they have to use reading to learn going forward. And, and if they don't have those early skills, you know, it's it's they're not going to be so successful later on. True. And yeah, I'm so glad to hear that there's an early reading program because I know my son Jack struggled immensely with reading. And it's been a, you know, I can speak from the other side of it. You know, he's finally getting to the point where he can read functionally, but he's missed a lot. So, uh, and, and it's so hard for them to catch up. It's hard. It's hard. I'm, I, I have to say I'm hopeful because there's neuroplasticity and even though he missed this stuff, there's ways, there's lots of ways to fill in. So I don't want any parents out there who sometimes like I would hear stuff that I wasn't doing and feel completely um, frustrated because I didn't, you know, it was like, oh, I didn't do this for him or I didn't do that. And they all ruined, but that's never, you know, I can tell you that from doing things really almost backwards in some way, I can't, hold on to that kind of a mindset you there's always something that can be done and um I think yeah but I think hearing about these early programs early when they're young in the district focusing on reading which is yeah is great to hear so yeah. back to the, your side track, track there uh back to your uh experience on the the school committee uh one thing you were you mentioned and I have to say that you wrote up these beautiful notes I hope it's okay if I post them um on the sure. page, yeah. and so yeah. people can reference. I, I can some make of them more stuff. readable too. They, they were just kind of my my brain dump, but <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's a pretty good organized brain dump. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So as far as like, there's a lot more kids being diagnosed. I thought, well, you know, I never, I hadn't thought of that. People are more aware of what what is a special need, and everybody wants to get 
as much as they can for their own kid. And then, you know, you're sitting and hearing these, the, the budget facts and how little money, you know, we actually have. And um, how did you kind of come to understand that? And yeah, it's, it was, it was a lot of learning and a lot of understanding of the way the state funding uh-huh. works for education. I think that's what I was trying to get at there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they, they did have a budget uh, foundation review commission, which came back and said there were two key areas that the, the state funding has not kept up with. One of them being health insurance of, you know, a district our size, we have so many employees that use the district's health insurance. And, you know, we all know health insurance rates and premiums have just gone up and up and up. Yes. And, you know, the the funding formula that we have has not kept pace with that. So that's one area. And then the other area is special education of, you know, there are so many more kids diagnosed nowadays with special education needs. And, that, you know, the allocation for that and the funding formula for that has not kept up with that. And we also know that there are a number of students who require an out-of-district placement. There are, you know, the, any district cannot meet the needs of every single student. There are no a lot of, you know, different disabilities that are relatively rare, and they're just outside the capabilities of any local school district. So there's always going to be a certain percentage of kids that need a specialized placement and you know that the the funding formula has not kept pace with that so that's been a challenge yes you know for districts because you know these these costs are going to go up regardless so then every area of the budget ends up getting squeezed and and that's the challenge that watch use it has is you know just every area of the budget is just so lean and so tight and you know the other challenge that, that we hear from folks in the community is they look at how many district employees we have and how many folks work at central office. And it looks like a huge number. Uh-huh. However, a big portion of that number is the special education support staff. A lot of our speech therapists and OTs and PTs and district coordinators are all in this district-wide central office staff. So it looks like there's, you know, 100 people working up there. But when you actually go up there, there's very few. So, you know, that's uh-huh. that's another challenge that we hear from the community is, oh, you know, it's so, you know, there's so many people. Well, a lot of these folks are working in all the different schools. And, you know, I remember talking to folks at some of the local schools, and they said, you know, okay, I've been here 20 years, and I was – you know, one speech therapist working here 20 years ago. Well, now the number of kids on my caseload just keeps going up and up and up. And I'm still one person, but there's so many more kids who need that same therapy. So, so it's a challenge just to keep pace with, you know, how, you know, the rising amount of kids that have needs in, in the district, like any district. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think we've kind of touched on some of these other questions. What are the greatest the greatest challenges for parents with special needs kids? Uh, I know you've you've kind of addressed that, but just to flesh out this a little bit. Um, yeah, I I think a couple of the most important things, just kind of looking back at at some of the big areas of needs and, you know, comments and questions that I hear from parents in our district as well as other districts is, you know, there's a lot of parents that don't want to rock the boat, don't want to make waves, and, and it's hard to advocate for your child, yes, especially it is. if you feel differently than the school staff does. You know, you're, you're grateful to the teacher in front of you for working so hard with your kid, but if your kid's not making progress, you need to be comfortable speaking up. And, and that's really hard, and, and I struggled with that when Meg was little, that, you know, I don't want to be critical of this teacher, but I need to look out for my kid, and that's number one. And, and you know, parents don't need to go to team meetings to be friends with these people. Yes, you need to be collegial. You need to work together. You don't want to be adversarial because that's not going to get you anywhere. But you need to be a really good advocate for your child. I have a good friend who used to be um, my advocate. I would take her to meetings uh-huh. early on when I wasn't comfortable being right. my own I advocate. Think that's- 
important is to bring, if you can bring, you know, even if you don't have an advocate, if you have a support, someone there to help you, to listen with you. Yes. Yeah, and and just be there as your support. Mm -hmm. And she always had a great analogy. And she said, think of your child and them growing up as taking your child on a cross-country trip. And the parent is planning mentally getting that kiddo from Massachusetts to California. And you're always thinking five steps ahead and you're thinking, you know, what skills are they going to need to be an adult because we're not going to live forever. And they need to be independent, which is hard to think about. But when you go to an IEP team meeting, you're thinking about getting them to California, but the team in front of you, they just want to get your kid out of that grade. You're yeah. just thinking, let's get them that. to the Connecticut border. <laughs> then it's someone else's responsibility. Right. So the parent always needs to have that big picture idea and be able to communicate that to the team. I think it's so important prior to a team meeting to send your vision and concerns to the team so that they know What's on your mind? What do you feel are the most important needs? And where do you see this child going? So you can remind them of, we're not just looking at 10th grade math goals. We're looking at how are we going to make this kid a functional adult so that they can go make a purchase in the community or plan out having a bank account and how that's going to look. You know, it's it's not about adding algebraic equations. You know, let's, yes. let's think about what this child really needs and what is the vision for the child. I mean, I remember sitting in, in meetings saying, you know, I feel like your vision for my child is bagging groceries at Big Y, which which may or may not be an appropriate right. vision for right. her and that may or may not be appropriate for other people. But my vision for her is to be living independently and having a competitive job, you know, and and I think it's so important for the this, this team, the school team to understand what the end goal is and for them to be thinking about that because typically, you know, just due to the nature of their roles, they're only thinking about that particular school year. So I think that's really important. I think it's critical for parents to know the law. And there are, you know, there are such great things in the law that parents have a lot of rights and there are certain timelines that need to be followed and and certain things that need to be done. And parents need to know that so that they don't get taken advantage of because things slip through the cracks. I I get that. But, you know, people need to be held accountable. Um, I think organization is really critical. Um, very early on, I went to a workshop on getting organized, and the the workshop had taught everyone how to make a three-ring binder. And it has different, you know, it has the IEP section, the progress report section, the outside evaluation section. And that is my go-to binder. I take that to every single meeting. And I've been in numerous meetings where I have the paper and the school they team don't. doesn't have it. Yes. <laughs> I believe it. I do believe yes. that. Yeah. I think that's a absolutely great suggestion. Just even the process of pulling that stuff in, together and putting it in a binder really helps you think through, you know, the history of your child and, you know, really brings into focus uh, all the things that need to be addressed and um, right there in front of you and having that, yeah. I think I yeah. heard that suggestion at that seminar, and I did binders. So, yeah, there's lots and of again, people it, listening, right? <laughs> and, and it shows also when you walk into a meeting that you're a well-informed, very knowledgeable parent. When you walk in and you have everything that you need right at your fingertips, you have it right there, and and just for the school team to know, you know, okay, this this is a parent who's going to hold us accountable, yes. and this is a parent who's going to follow up. That's really, really important. Like anything, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and if they understand that you are the squeaky wheel, that that will go far. You yes. know, one one of the best compliments I ever got was from a long term team member that had been on our team, and you know. She and I disagreed on some things over the years, but, you know, we we had a great relationship Uh and and we could disagree without it becoming adversarial. And at the end of our last meeting, she pulled me aside and she said, 
You advocate for your daughter just like I would advocate for mine. And that was just the biggest compliment coming from her. Just, you know, she had been in meetings with us and, you know, not all of them were, were, you know, you know, everything hunky dory. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But by her recognizing Mm -hmm. 